Um, yes, you talked about being a sane individual. Um, somebody asked me in an interview, uh, some Hawaiians actually, there was some cryptozoological uh, association, they, they've made these Hawaiian guys. It was about two years ago, they interviewed me on my show. And they said, and we always like to ask people if, if you direct questions at the end of the interview. And they said, um, are you sane? I said, no, not in anything <laughs> apart from this. I'm sane in this respect. In yeah. this genre, I'm very sane and everything else, I'm crazy. And um, they were like, oh, okay. And I think, you know, it could be a very exciting, very sane searching and um and decent genre whatever it, it was paranormal or cryptozoology or, or whatever if it was um researched without the you know with an awareness of one's implicit bias i don't think you can shake that off but if you know you've got it like me i'm a very religious person i know i've got it i know i've got the bias so i can factor that in every time and say yes i think this but also let's factor in the religious bias to my conclusion and declare it. So, you know, yep. that's my background. Uh, how does that affect you? You're, you're a therapist. Is that right? No. What are you? <laughs> oh, to me, that's who I am. <laughs> yeah. I'm a, I'm an educator and okay. the, the, what I educate people with is, you know, how, how you lose your sense of worth and value about yourself. And if your life starts off that way, you'll make, more likely make worth less choices instead of worthwhile choices for yourself. So sure. what I try to do is uh, put a down to earth uh, language to therapeutic theories and concepts. So the general public can understand them better instead of it flying over their head. So that's okay. kind of what I do it's in the so field. Weird. I do counseling and teach courses on all okay. this kind of stuff that I yeah, design. You, you're a therapist. <laughs> You're a therapist. I mean, it's therapy. Just, well, the the idea is to it's see how psychiatry. You know, but is it therapy. is it anybody as crazy as I am? That's what I'm looking for. I did a test a long time ago. That's really? what started me all off on this road. Is uh, is everyone else as insanely nutty as I am, or what? Yeah. <laughs> and I found out that yes, we're all delusional. Yep, every yeah. single one of us. But yeah. when you don't know it, that causes problems. But uh, it so. causes problems i think that i mean i agree with you completely i think it causes problems in, in two ways one that you um we don't know that we're delusional in some fashion and we we carry on with those delusions and two we think everything is only delusional and we lose all hope yeah right? and i think it's if you're educating people to find a meaning within that that narrow bridge in the middle fantastic more power to you i like that stuff i'm i i've realized recently that i'm more interested in the psychology of, let's say, cryptozoology, but the psychology of Sasquatch, because it's alliteration, and I like, I'm addicted to that. Um, addicted, being addicted to alliteration is a, you know, that's a, that's a, a very strange pun in itself, isn't it? So yes, I, I like the psychology of Sasquatch more than the actual sightings. Well, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's for sure. I mean, when I got online to do the whole Bigfoot thing, it wasn't just about looking for Sasquatches. It was about doing research about the system of what comes, what happens to somebody that comes into the Bigfoot community. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so you're coming in from an objective uh, angle. Um, not that I don't believe in Sasquatch, but um, that's that's what amazes me is what I've walked into, uh, and I'm kind of surprised. Uh, there is my therapy cat. She's. <laughs> She's uh, wanting some attention here. Lovely. <laughs> here, buddy. <laughs> Go over there. Go play with something. She can okay. join. She can join. She's welcome. <laughs> well, she probably will because she likes yeah. people's laps and necks and heads and stuff. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, it's been fascinating to see how people's processing system works in their brain in regards to a data data uh, collecting, and it fits quite well with what I do uh, as a profession because. A lot of times there are perceptions that we have about ourselves we just take for face granted instead of actually grabbing one of them and taking real taking a real good serious look at it. Um, before we get going too much, I have to let you know, Andy, I've tried to save a bit of gray cells for this interview because I've been getting interviewed quite a bit this week and it's been just a crazy oh, week. Well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. I think I'm on number three this week, which has been quiet, actually. It's been quiet, and I'm working full time at the moment, and uh, not complaining, but things are busy. 
and um but i like it i just think it's for me it's like 10 at night it's a good time the kids are asleep nice. it's going up and i've just got this this time to um be with my daytime friends across the sea <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have a bit of advantage too because it's two o'clock my time, so yes. yeah, <laughs> which is in the you afternoon. In, um, Okanagan, is that right? Are you in? Yeah. Uh, is that British Columbia or what that is, is that exactly? That is British Columbia. Yes. Southern British Columbia. Okay. Uh, okay. And it's it's one of the uh, when I was interviewed last night, uh, people asked me that, and I said, "Well, where do you live?" And I said, "I live in paradise." Because yeah. in regards to Canada weather, it's great here <laughs> compared okay. to the rest of the country. Oh, so. You're the wine-grown region, right? This is correct. Yes, yeah, so yeah. it has that kind of you know French winery area. Yeah. Uh, it's quite it's quite a beautiful area, and there's hundreds of lakes around here. Probably 500 lakes easily. Uh, just over here on top of this mountain up here that I live Well, on. I mean, the only reason I really know some of the background to the, the area is because of the Pogos. Ogre Pogo, oh. Iggy Pogo, Mana Pogo. I'm a lake monster yeah. guy yeah. Uh, originally. And that's um, that's why I know where you live. I'm like, wow, he lives there. That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and that's what I say. Oh, I love living here. It's, <laughs> it's just beautiful. It's yeah. Beautiful, so. And that's a huge, I mean, it's a huge region as well, right? It's a... Uh, is it a yeah. region or it's a, well, how would you class the, the, the area you that I'm in? States, you have regions, right? Um, yeah, well, we have the uh, British Columbia is a province, one of the provinces province. of Canada. Province. Yeah. Okay. And it's, yeah. you know, the size of some major countries out there, just this province. So, uh, yeah. and I'm in the southern area of it. Uh, we call it the Okanagan Valley. It's kind of what yeah. I mean. It's quite a long range of uh, mountains and lake, uh, but the weather's milder here than most places in Canada so we, we get like four months of snow maybe maybe okay. four months of snow whereas in any, anywhere else in Canada you're getting eight months of snow okay. <laughs> I'm sorry to my Canadian viewers I know that's not necessarily true no. but I'll embellish for our British I friends what you're saying. <laughs> it's the Canadian Riviera right yes 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 yes, yes, yeah. yes. It's, a, it's yeah. a good way of saying yeah. it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now look I am um, I I can go with that I it's not the same deal I know Canada gets some real weather um, but I grew up in Wales, and um, in the the west, it rains constantly. In Wales, it rains like a daily on a daily basis. The the, the sky is seventy percent overcast throughout the year. Seventy percent of the year is overcast sky, and oh. um, it's a beautiful place. But it's very green and kind of moody. I live in England now. I live uh, just outside of London, right. and to me here, it's it's it, I feel like it's a dry, flat place. And it's not particularly dry or particularly flat. It's just where I came from, what I have to compare to. It yes. makes it a sort of paradise of sorts. Um, I've always wanted to go to Canada. I always wanted to visit Lake Okanagan and the other local lakes, the Monster Lakes, of course, and um, and waste some of my time water watching there as I do in Loch Ness and things like that. Like I always said that Lake Monster watching is... Um, uh, I'd say it's, it's twice as boring as fishing, but 10 times more fascinating. <laughs> because at least when you fish, you catch something or you, yeah. catch, you know. <laughs> uh, but Lake Monster watching, you might as well watch paint dry. I mean, if you look at the water for 10, 12 hours and you just get you know, blindness, you get this water blindness. And uh, you're always convinced that something's going to come out. I went to Lake Champlain in the US yep. uh, with a researcher there. And I, I literally watched that water six, seven hours every day as I would in Loch Ness and these other places. And I just thought, what are you waiting for? I mean, so what, it doesn't what, mean nothing's there. What got you into it? Have you seen one? Have you seen no. a, a lake monster? Never. Or? No, I've never seen a lake monster. Um, and I've looked. <laughs> it sounds like you've it's looked. I would have brought a fishing line regardless if you've seen anything or not, just for no. something else to do. <laughs> I mean, I've been to... to uh, Loch Ness, uh, Loch Lochy, uh, Loch Mora. I've been to Loch Oi. These many of these are connected to Loch Ness, by the way. Uh, Lake Windermere, uh, uh, Bathinthwaite Lake, uh, Lake Min Take it in Wales, which has a monster legend too. To Cornwall to look for Morgaur and all these places. There was a a sea monster sighting of some kind in 2016 in the River Thames, and I was on the River Thames between the I second and third that. sighting. Constantly. I remember hearing about that. Yeah, I mean, I was real time searching for that beast, mm -hmm. and um, it was that which was fascinating. If you think of what the River Thames is, really, we've 
it's amazing we even get whale strandings in there these days um yeah and you know it just it doesn't happen but i think um with these things it's something very curious about looking for something that's incredibly rare or incredibly shy or retiring or unidentified is essentially you've got an idea of what you're looking for but you don't really know what you're looking for you're looking for something that somebody else has described right based upon their impression and uh, this probably would intrigue you a lot um, when you look at these old depictions in mythology and folklore and, and ancient yep. history of strange creatures, the description of these creatures has been taken from the mental available mental library within those persons' minds. So you might yep. see something with a long neck and a head like a fox and wings like a bat, which could be flippers or, or whatever you want. Um, and you have strange creatures like the, you know, the the griffin and all of these other things, which or the satyr, which clearly had some sort of basis in something at some point. And um, I wonder how often we do that these days too. You know, we'd project, you know, based upon our, our culture and our society, we project some sort of um, meaning or identification onto the thing we see, even if we see it. Now, you had a strange sighting, Daniela told me, I mean, of a strange creature, but in a very strange activity. Do you want to tell us about that, the moose? And no, the, I don't oh, want to tell you about it. It's too embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> People are going to think I'm a crazy guy. Well, I mean, I'm going to lose my job. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, yeah, I see. I mean, the thing about me is I deal with the brain a lot. So, mm-hmm. um, and uh, just to get doing research on Bigfoot stuff like that, too, I, it, uh, the reason I kind of got involved with it was to get me out of my head, get me in the bush and give me a psychological break from being in people's minds. Uh, and then I walked into a different kind of mind, the online Bigfoot community cultural yeah. mind. And I thought yeah. it's kind of interesting. Oh, and yeah. because of how things unfolded for me when I uh, had a, a sighting, uh, it wasn't, it was really different. And I was, it, I, I didn't actually share anything with, uh, I shared it to certain people, just uh, probably five people before Daniela uh, got me to share it on uh, hidden uh, in mysteries, is that right? It's existence. Existence. Yeah. Sorry, Daniel, yeah. in case okay. she's watching. Um, but, uh, and the reason why I was hesitant was um, I didn't know how to formulate it in an articulated way that would make contextual sense to people who would hear the encounter. Okay. Because it was so different. So I, that's kind of the pre-set up for people who are viewing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you uh, something really, really strange now. That's the fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. So um, when I was younger, about nine years old, uh, I used to live in the province of Alberta, which is right next to the mm-hmm. province of British Columbia. And my uh, g- grandmother li- used to live on Vancouver Island in BC. And we were heading over for a trip. And when you're driving... Uh, through the mountains and stuff you're not really driving the way you would be probably in Alberta or um, Saskatchewan or other areas in Canada where you can drive straight and fast because you're going through the mountain ranges and stuff and there's quite a few lakes well there's just hundreds and hundreds of lakes in BC and we have a lot of these chain lakes or locks I think is what you guys use for the word lake right Uh, that's in Scotland Scotland lock is for a Scottish lake just be fact. Yeah. Well, keep teaching me different types of English. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not even English. It's uh, okay. yeah, yeah, lock oh, in Scotland, right. yeah. Lynn in, in Wales. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Anyway. Okay. So anyway, so we're driving down the road, and so my family and that we're you know we're bush people. We've hunted, or my family's hunted quite a bit throughout the years. And uh, so as we were driving, we were driving fairly slow because we're going around these fairly sharp bends, and there's uh, large lake chains, and some of the lakes are really large and then they go into little smaller lakes and larger lakes medium-sized lakes and as we were kind of going around through the uh, uh this one area as i go into my head there and i'm looking down to my left which tells you that this is factually i'm remembering it that's what that body language means for your eyes for people at home uh, <laughs> uh i looked over to my left and i saw something in the middle of this smaller lake and smaller lake would be about 500 yards across probably uh-huh. and uh and I thought, 
what is that? And first thing I noticed was it was a moose. And I was quite familiar with moose because we had pounded moose and gutted mm -hmm. moose and cleaned moose and prepped moose and all that kind of stuff. But there was something on the moose that didn't make any sense to what I was seeing. And, and at first it was just a kind of a black object that was moving on the moose. And then when I looked at it, I seen what I thought I saw, and as soon as I seen what I thought I saw, I turned to everybody in the car, and I said to everybody, did you guys see that? Did you guys see that? And uh, they go, see what? I said, did you see that monkey? Monkey? What monkey? That monkey that's on the moose. <laughs> of course, you know, siblings can be pretty brutal to you. Yeah, yes, sure. <laughs> and I have three older brothers, right? So oh, <laughs> I'm the youngest of three older brothers, so I'm going to be okay. in some pretty hot seat pretty quick there. And, and they, so all... they still bring it up. Oh. <laughs> no, surprisingly, they, they actually, even though they know what they do today, you know, they don't bring it up, actually. Um, so uh, I, they all said, what monkey? And there, of course, there's craziness. You know, you're crazy or whatever, because we don't have any monkeys in Canada. Yeah, sure. sure. But uh, that when I was looking at was um, moose have fairly long necks mm. that are kind of so, sometimes a little lo longer than actually horses, depending on what to uh, breed the horses. And I'm going to shift arms here. So a moose uh, will go forest or, or go into a lake and it'll dip its head under the water, mm. forage from underneath the, on the a bottom of the lake and get weeds and bulbs and stuff that are down there and then it'll dip its head down and then do that and then bring its head back up and go much 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 and that's exactly what this moose was doing uh -huh. and and uh, but the weird thing about it was that black object so i'll try to sit back here but so you can see so this is kind of the moose's neck this uh -huh. is the moose's head this is the back part of the moose the shoulders and this object kept moving up and down like that and so when the moose went and dipped its head down under the water, that's when I noticed it looked like a monkey because yeah. it actually climbed down the arm. And it didn't climb down the arm with its butt first. It climbed down the arm with its head first. Huh. And it actually, I remember one time, <laughs> I have it right in my head right now, is when the moose went down, it, it would go right by the moose's head, but stayed just above the water line. I remember its left hand going out and uh, touching it a bit. And then the moose would come back up like this, and then the thing would come down for the sake of the conversation, I, it's like a toddler Sasquatch. Mm. And then it would come down and sit back here on its back. And then the moose would go down again and then it would do the same kind of thing. And then it went back up <laughs> and did that did about three times. Watched it for about a minute and a half because, again, we're not driving fast. We're driving slow. Uh, but I'm, I haven't told that statement I said to everybody in the car because I was too absorbed at what I was looking at. Mm. And uh, uh, so... <sighs> When I looked at that, I thought, I thought, did I see what I saw? And I thought, yeah, I, I believe I do, did see what I had saw. Um, but I didn't know what to do with the information, especially after sharing it in the car and getting and, and based it. Yeah, it based about the whole thing. The interesting okay. thing about that experience was one thing that I, I it's as plain as day as to uh, as plain as day today as it was when I seen it was the moose was not in duress or stress at all that this was thing was on its back. The toddler, for the sake of the conversation, Sasquatch didn't look like it was worried. Obviously, it was almost like the nurse the the moose was nursing mm -hmm. the the Sasquatch. If I could have only seen it the way I could see it today, that would be investigating mm -hmm. it a whole different way for sure. Stop the car, get out, you guys go that way, you go this way. But uh, it was really perplexing. So again, I mean, if uh, unless I've had a few pints of beer with people, I mean, who are you going to share that information with? Well, I think the qualification process has to be a lengthy one. Um. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so what I that's one reason why I didn't share it. Plus, I needed yeah. context so I could describe it, what I talked about. So it would make uh -huh. sense. So people wouldn't know, would know that. Well, this Had you is. heard anything about Bigfoot at that age, age nine? I mean, nope. were you familiar nope. with? No, nope. nope. because if it would have and if it would have, my brain would, wouldn't have said monkey. That's what I think, too. And it we, would we have it would went yeah. to Sasquatch or, hey, there's a Bigfoot over there. That's no, one of the, get, the things I used to look out for. What, right. what what did they describe it as? Monkey man, caveman, giant gorilla, right. upright chimpanzee. Right. 
all those because things. your brain stores all that data that's picked up in its life, ninety-five yeah. percent of it's subconsciously taken in. Yeah. Uh, it draws from the resources of what looks familiar, and that's kind of like a pareidolia style of thinking mm. process. So it, it's going to drive, grab that data that's in your brain. You're not your brain, mm -hmm. and that data, the closest thing I have in my head that's related to that is Curious George because I used to read oh, Curious yeah. George books all the time. So that's why I went to Monkey. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got interviewed yesterday, one of the interviewers said, did it have a tail? I said, no, I don't think Curious George has a tail, does he? <laughs> I can't remember yeah, now. <laughs> but uh, so I, but I didn't notice the tail on it. That was the other thing, because when they asked me, they immediately said, no, I didn't have a tail on it. And um, but again, I mean, how do you share something like that? So it's it took me quite a well, it took me about three or four years to kind of process a narrative that would make contextual sense for people. So the question is, is there other animals that have done kind of strange companionship with each other sure yeah well now for sure because we can yeah. see it on youtube right but yeah. uh, and that's what i usually would draw draw the narrative from is you've seen grizzly bear and wolf that are usually predatory mm. killer enemies befriend each other and seem to share with each other crows who've taken after kittens dolphins that rescued humans uh, mm. bamboo uh, bam <laughs> what is i'm looking for leon uh Bab bam Baboons? thank you yeah <laughs> there goes one Baboons. of my gray cells in my brain uh, no, bamboo just... boons will uh hijack and kidnap puppies raise mm. them so that they're sentries for their uh troops and I mean, uh, yeah you know, we don't give animals enough credit i think no. really we really don't um because it's easier it's better for us to believe that they're just a bit dumb Oh own. yeah, totally. Or that yeah, they don't communicate with one another, and yet they share the same environment. Um, I I class animal individual animals the same as people in the sense of they have personalities and a range of free will actions to take and uh, intelligent moves to make to to survive in the world, and they're willing to adapt and you know change the narrative. There was that one with the 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 lion lioness who lost the cub. And uh, adopted a fawn, a gazelle fawn, right. uh, for several days. I think she looked right. after this thing, rescued it from the the pride, and you know, fiercely guarded it in the tree. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it happens all the time. One of the things, that obviously, everybody asks you as soon as you tell the story, it must be detail, distance, detail. You said it was all black. That's an interesting concept. A lot of people often. They are, are described as being black, but sometimes there seems to be a sheen, an open sheen to the hair or a variant of grey and brown strips of hair throughout. What kind of description can you give us for that? I can Everybody's give you obviously dying, dying to know. <laughs> well, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I'm going to disappoint you, Andy. I'm going to disappoint you. I can only see it as a nine-year-old traveling in a car. Uh -huh. And the problem with that is uh, you're at a nine years old, you don't have the same brain that you're going to have after you're 24, where your frontal cortex is now developed. Uh, so you're not, uh, nine year olds aren't really looking for details in things. They're looking for uh, emotional imprints of the, of the perceptions of what they're negotiating with. So it's very precise. I could tell you the actions that were significant mm. for a nine year old, which is they were playing nine year olds mm. play. Uh, the the toddler Sasquatch was playing down the neck. That's what mm. was so neat. That's why I was excited when I said, hey, 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 do you guys see that monkey? Did you guys see that monkey playing on that moose? That's a nine-year-old's response. That's not an adult's response. So, uh -huh. and again, it's only a minute and a half long. And I'm, you know, for what I do as a profession, I, I'm aware that the brain has a terrible tendency of drawing resources, those Lego blocks in it. Uh, into past events. So the question is kind of like, how does uh, one, right? So I have a bit want of to build up the event uh, to be more detailed than you remember, right? For the sake of giving a clear explanation, of right. course. Or because trying to what the defend people do. your position because you're getting ridiculed. Yes. That's I what mean, you're you should bringing. never do that because you're already claiming that you saw a uh, juvenile Sasquatch playing on the moose. Now, to me, that seems to be, if I received the sighting from somebody else, I would think, well, this. Yes, somebody could be bold enough to make up something really random, but for a creature that would be a natural creature living yeah. out in the woods with other natural animals, these interactions you should expect them to happen at some time, especially if it's an, an intelligent primate like animal. Um, so, why not? I think, well, that sounds very plausible. And when Daniela told me about your setting, I said, 
I like that. I'd like to hear about that a bit more. That is a lot better to me than the snarling, growling, you know, eight foot tall, heavily muscled beast that um, uh, used its infrasound on you. I prefer the the joyful <laughs> juvenile Sasquatch playing on the neck of the moose, uh, or perhaps even using it to, to gather some of these tasty bulbs from the lake and sort of putting the hand in and, and grabbing a few on the side as they came up, whatever was happening. I don't know. But that that's fascinating. Very fascinating. Do you think, I mean, clearly that didn't meet a, a, a sudden interest in cryptozoology and other things, or did, did an interest in these creatures stay with you from that point onwards, or did you have some sort of reawakening, pardon the, 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 the term, where you came back to the genre and said, actually, I, I'm quite interested in this now. I want to look further into it. Um, well, I, I think, again, because when you're nine years old, you're nine years old, you're processing things as just events. So, you can, you know, you go snow tobogganing. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it, there's, not, there's not a kind of an interest kind of thing unless, I mean, I know some people who have had encounters when they were quite young and it was not as protected. They're not in a vehicle. Uh, they don't see it for long, and the event was very mm. dramatically yeah. responded to their situation where it actually paralyzed them in their fight, flight, freeze, or faint uh, uh, defense mechanism. Uh, the the other thing, a little bit, and you're going to help have to help me keep stay on target here, Andy, because I'm Absolutely. like a, okay. I never stay on target. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're I'll welcome to just yeah. <laughs> so. You know, the idea about that's possible. Well, again, when I was getting interviewed the other day, I said, you know, a hundred years ago in Canada, we used to have moose. Uh, we used to train moose. You can train a moose to pull a plow, uh, mm -hmm. to pull sleds. Uh, to We used to ride them. And so uh, the interesting thing is if, if a Sasquatch is uh, more, has a higher conscious availability to itself. In other words, what that means, it can recognize itself as it mm -hmm. sees itself compared to just uh, not being able to have conscious awareness. Uh, and the debate, of course, is are they more human-like or are they yeah. this? And I don't know what they are. They're Sasquatches, whatever that happens to be. But if they're more human-like, well, if, if humans, humanoids, can ride mooses and train mooses and hang out with mooses, and they're supposed to have a higher conscience ability as far as Sasquatch theories are, um, yeah, I would think so that uh, something like that could happen. Uh, I, can't... I agree. If a, mo uh, if a baboon can uh, steal and raise a puppy to be a sentry guard, then the Sasquatch can train a moose. <laughs> to dig out some tasty bulbs from the lake. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, anything you deal with, any kind of strange kind of thought, mm. uh, uh, you know, uh, ID, ideology, you know, paranormal yeah. stuff, Sasquatch stuff, uh, dog man, whatever uh, you want to call it. I mean, uh, most of it's all speculation and hypothesis. It, is. it really and, is. And that's, the, that's probably the frustrating part for myself. Um, there's a reason why when I look back on that incident, I know that that particular incident isn't just a fabrication of different memories and ideas that's been projected on that. And the advantage that I have had, unfortunately, in my life, which has helped me do what I do today professionally, is I was sexually abused actually as a baby. Oh, wow. OK. OK. So I'm about eight months when this has happened. But the problem is I have you have three brains in your brain your primal, your emotional, and then your cognitive brain. Uh -huh. But I'm only operating under my primal brain because my emotional brain hasn't developed yet because I'm only eight months old. That's going to happen over the next two to three years. Sure. And then I'm going to start at five to seven years old. I'm going to start getting this little sliver of logic that says, hey, how can Santa be at this store, that store, and that store? So there's okay. this, you know, so before that, it's magical thinking, right? <laughs> and that's where the brain usually would draw and connect dots for past memories when you're younger. So it, you have to be very specific. So I had to negotiate for my own uh, sense of well being as whether or not I was a, an adult person who perceived I was sexually abused as a baby uh -huh. compared to uh, an adult person that was sexually abused as a baby. Okay, I understand. Yeah, sure. So because, and the because only reason the way that memory would be so, stored as a very uh, a juvenile, I mean, not even a toddler. Yeah, and so, uh, but there is a recording system in my primal brain, which is my pictorial and my auditorial uh -huh. system. 
Uh-huh. And on top of that, I have a, a, a kind of a sensory perception in my nervous system that absorbs information. And especially when you're a toddler, up to 25 feet around your circumference. Mm-hmm. So it's not what mom and dad are saying. It's what I'm feeling from mom or dad. Okay. And so you have to access a different part of your brain to find out whether or not that's a valid kind of um, reality that my perception of what actually I think happened actually did happen. Okay. And, and so a way of knowing that is... Am I carrying sexual energy in my body because emotion is energy in motion in my body, sexual emotion in my body way before my body's development should have it? Oh, I see. But how do you find that out? Well, then you have to have access to your other brain, other brains. Remember, because these three brains aren't connected to each other. They're separate. Is that like a regressive therapy method or something like that? I mean, well, you have way, to find out what yeah. happened. Yeah, you have to really understand how the inside works, especially uh-huh. your sensory perceptions of how they work, how your thinking process works and that. So your primal part of your brain actually engages in 0.08 seconds ahead of your cognitive brain. Uh-huh. So a lot of times when you hear people talk about paranormal uh, encounters, you, their primal brains are actually already hijacked and is actually moving already mm-hmm. forward, either in fight, flight, freeze, or faint. I get it. Yeah. Right? Where, and then all of a sudden, the event's over, and then your cognitive brain, now 0.8 seconds, is now aware, is now consciously aware. Cognitive brain moves slower than the other two brains, because the other two brains are in, in, instinctual. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because you have okay. big systems, okay? Uh, I hope yeah. we're not getting deeper. No, but it's <laughs> like, it's, doing it's, two hours between, it's a difference between uh, reflex and the, your the size of action to move. Right. right. Yeah, that's, that's slower. It has to be right. slower. Because yeah. you have to make the decision. I completely understand. Yeah. Um, well, that's, I mean, that's very interesting. And based upon that, there was a, a little uh, blog I wrote, which I actually presented to the um, uh, to the Ghost Club of London, one of the oldest ghost clubs in the world. They invited me that's to speak. Cool. I don't know why. And uh, it was, <laughs> what was it called? It was um, it was basically a, an entire blog about that about how our uh, sort of instinctive reactions to things based upon our foundational cultural beliefs and the things we've inculcated uh, uh, into our philosophical or faith-like outlook on life dictate what we're looking at. And one of the examples I, I made to them was when uh, Cortes's ships were sailing towards the shores there and the, the Aztecs and uh, Moctezuma, the king, and the people who saw them imagined them floating mountains. And Moctezuma, their king, imagined them with Quetzalcoatl returning from the, right. from the east. 100%. And invited yeah. them in to essentially take over their entire society. And these were terrible. I mean, the Cortes and guys essentially pirates, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and they thought they were gods, right? And they were gods. They the, they, they, their, their position was that they, they fit the description of what it, he's supposed to look like when he comes back. Their and doom, so they and they were terrified based upon that. Yeah, their yeah. doom was based upon that. But also, they couldn't identify the ships. Another point right. they making, they thought they were mountains. So they didn't look like mountains, but that was the mental library file exactly. that they had. And I, I totally concur with that. I think, um, you know, I've been in situations in the woods at night and in different ways when I've had experiences that I know, I know for a fact that have been completely fabricated by my fear. I know it. There's wisdom. There's wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Uh, I actually told this to, to another researcher one time, and, and that researcher said, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll register that as a sighting. I said, that's not, not a sighting. Nothing happened other than I, 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 got, I shit myself. I got, I got scared in the woods at nighttime. That's all that happened. Yeah. Nothing, I didn't see anything, really. I didn't hear anything unusual. I just became... Um, overly aware of every sound and uh, movement that was already there before something set me off right and then it rolled on from there and um the funny thing about that experience and i don't know if you've you've gone these little research hunt expeditions the funny thing about those experiences actually is it gets you thinking now you've seen a sasquatch from a car on a moose um once you're in that position and you actually believe you might be having an experience and you're sort of far away from civilization, the one thing that pops into your mind really is, do I really want to be here? Because there's no backing out. 
totally. Do I, do I really want this now? Because actually, if it's a bad situation, or if this animal, that's an individual, makes a decision that it doesn't want me there, and it's going to have to get rid of me, I'm helpless. I'm not going to be able to stop it, hit it, fight it, shoot it, nothing. Well, we don't whoa, have slow, guns. slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. Uh, listen, you get the same effect when you're looking for grizzlies, when you're yes. looking for bear, when you're looking for cougars. Uh, cougars bother me more than grizzlies. Uh, grizzlies, grizzlies are up there, but cougars for me are, are the spooky stealth ones that bother me the most because they'll grab you so fast that you, and they're so stealth you won't hear them coming. Yeah. Um, so when, uh, yeah, when you're looking for anything, there's a part about be, the part about being in the bush, the feedback loop you get to your system is you get to know you, Yeah. you get to understand how you work, how you get spooked. Like you were saying, I recognize it yeah. was me spooking me. And that's part about making a person solid. So just by going in the bush by yourself in a wise way, an educated way, not a magical fairy kind of <laughs> thinking way, because we, nature is pretty brutal it's it's an yeah. it's a instinctual environment it has nothing to do with logic it has to do with extinct extinct extinction uh you know what i'm saying Freudian slip. Yeah. It's, Freudian it's, slip. yeah so it's it's your it's they're operating out of primal brain which means there's no thinking it's just doing yeah. that's what you know they're not stepping outside themselves and consciously thinking well i'm gonna go over there and look for a duck you know it's uh, we're, we just go there because we're primarily driven to feed mm -hmm. ourselves and that over there has what we're looking for and we do it so however depending on the animal as they move older like if you have a dog at home and stuff you ever notice when people are talking to dogs they always do baby talk or mm -hmm. kitty talk oh did they get the dog goes down it's all great well the reason why that happens that we do that is because when we look into the eyes of a dog it activates our memory from about two years old of how our parents used to uh, talk okay. to us great and uh and uh, up to two years old when you're dealing with a, a, a two-year-old they are kind of collecting data the same way uh, pets, the dogs would collect data. Mm -hmm. So they're just very present. You know, they're just either there or they're mad or they're not mad. You know, give me my dog. Yeah, in the moment. They live in the yeah. moment. They don't have an internal dialogue like we have as adults in mm -hmm. our head. They have an external one that gets developed by them playing. And you, when you ever hear kids play, they always go, oh, where could take? Oh, here's Ken and Barbie. Oh, Barbie's going out for a date with Ken. You'll hear them narrate out of their mouth. Mm -hmm. And that, and as, as you keep emotionally developing and going through the five stages of emotional development, what happens is it, it internalizes as your thought process vocabulary. So that's the one that you hear in your mind or in your, your brain. Your mind should be over here, and it's called metacognition, to have the capacity to hear your thinking as you think it. Yeah. That's metacognition. And then it's the same with your feelings. You, you feel your feelings as you're feeling them, but you're over here outside of yourself. You're witnessing self, sensory perceptions and hearing the scripts and the feelings and also your emotional response to it. Most people don't have or have forgotten that you're not your brain, that you're something else. You're your you're, you're consciousness about yourself. Oh, yes. so I understand. When you, you know what I mean? So you get kind of hijacked when you're in the bush or hijacked. Uh, if you're just in these three centers here, man, you're just reactatory. That's where your life ends up going. So it's pretty hard to renegotiate that with kind of what we're talking about, I guess. So, And I suppose that the way you compensate for that really essentially is by by knowing, by filling your head with knowledge, knowledge about the environment, the animals, the way they behave, what certain signs mean. And surely that's the same with everything in the way that when you're in the bush there, you're looking for sign of cougar or grizzly or, or black bear or whatever you have in your area or other signs that could be dangerous, environmental signs. Isn't it strange in a way that we don't, we almost don't do that very same thing, the cryptozoology. We mm. almost make it what we want it to be instead of what it is. Right. You wouldn't go into the woods where there were grizzly bears and cougars and look at the sign and the tracks and the scat and maybe a fresh kill and interpret that as a as a welcome and an invite to go further and see where they were with you. Right. Um, everybody would have the same reaction to those signs because they're set signs and we know they mean something. And yet with something like Sasquatch or um, any other cryptozoological animal, any other unknown animal, we seem to, to like to write the script and right. say, well, actually, I believe this means this and this means that. 
Um, yeah, well, I've seen yeah, people look at sticks and say an X means do not enter, and then walk straight through. Yeah, yeah, really. yeah totally. And I think that's kind of like, for me, uh, I've been trying to develop a team over the last five years, and we actually have a fellow named Nick Evans, who's from uh, Raw Skills Bushcraft. He's from Wales, ex-British oh, okay. military. Yeah, ex-British military. And uh, a survivalist and stuff. Um, but the good thing about Nick is he's used to being in the bush. Oh. And because he's also has war, uh, he's done uh, different uh, uh, duties in, I think it was in Afghanistan and maybe Iraq. He's used to being uh, in situations that will peak your system, overload mm -hmm. your system, flush your system. And then another fellow we have is uh, a retired um, uh, fire chief for uh, one of the, firehouses in vancouver island mm. aren't for vancouver and the good thing about that is you have you want people on your team that can learn how to negotiate the regulation of your body when you're in tense mm. crap so you can stay solid or fairly aware of what your system is doing mm. to you so you you still do the job you don't let your body hijack you from doing the job yeah and uh, and i think that you know the idea is uh i said to a few people uh, if there's a Sasquatch there in the bush, they're loading me up with cameras and let me go. <laughs> and you guys keep all the other cameras on me. And if it's a grizzly or if it's a cougar, put the, put it down. <laughs> you shoot it, you know. But if it's a Sasquatch, I'll go walk right to the bloody thing, you know. And uh, you have to do that. Uh, if that's what you're, if you're serious enough doing it. Now, I wouldn't do that ridiculously stupid, but I, I kind of laugh with them. I said, look, I've dropped dead six times already. And or sorry, five times and and almost another time about two weeks ago. Uh, so uh, I, I've worked that negotiate death to me already a few times. So the good thing is uh, I will be known as the dead man who proves Sasquatch's existence. Yeah. You guys will all become millionaires because you'll have it all on film, and you'll say he was such a great guy to sacrifice his life. Yeah. I mean, my name would be remembered for the rest he of humanity. He gave his life so that we could live in the lap yeah. of luxury. <laughs> totally. I think that's a scripture verse. Wonderful. Yes, yes. No, yeah. no greater thing than a man laid on his life for others. That's great. That's a great. <laughs> for the It'd glory like of the, death. To the one the uh, bear guy. You remember the bear guy? That whole documentary gets killed at the end. Harrowing. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, exactly. Essentially, you know, he gave his that's arms and legs, example. literally, that's so that we could live. Um, I think it's an interesting creature. I think, generally speaking, based upon the descriptions that people give, the behavioural descriptions that people give, this bluff charge type of activity that engages in, you know, the, the short halt before any harm takes place, tends, it seems to be of a primate. I mean, it looks like a primate anyway of some kind, but it seems to have primate-like behavioural characteristics. And you're wanting to stay away from people would be would be one of those and it seems to if it does exist it does seem to be very adept at staying out of our way and i think you know we're clumsy we're noisy we smell um if we're walking through the forest it's quite easy to avoid us how many times have you been walking through the forest and seen a bear or a cougar or a badger right yeah. not, that, not that often in areas you know them to be yeah. uh, present so it's i always wonder well and in the vast wilderness like Canada, um, or even if you go further up, like Alaska, someplace like that, how would you know? You wouldn't know. Yeah. Can't well, know then again, I've walked right next to deer that were right three, yes. four feet from my left. You know, I've, yeah. I mean, I've been at probably three yards from a grizzly, <laughs> and that was not a fun time, trust me. No. Uh, and I just had to really do some major techniques to get me out of that one because it was stalking me for 45 minutes prior to me seeing really? it. Um, wow. Uh, so I did, were you yeah, alone? Yeah, I was alone and oh, I had no. heat exhaustion and it was 30 degrees, 35 degrees Celsius on the side of a mountain okay. when it hit me. And uh, that's when the, the grizzly started to start stalking me. Okay, so that it Satan, clicked that you were, you were in, in bad condition. Yeah, I was in bad. I was in really risky. I mean, condition. the bear clicked. It, it noticed and said, "This guy's not doing well. I'll, yeah. Let's um stick around." Yeah, yeah, stick around. Yeah, and keep <laughs> out of sight, though. It kept out of sight. Yeah. Kept it just wow. in this little tree line or this tree line to the left of the mountain club that I was in, and then uh, then it stayed in that all the way down. It was a 
the reason why I was on the side of the mountain was my company sent me in there because there was an avalanche that went through uh-huh. about a decade and a half ago. And they wanted to see whether or not they, we could come in and reclaim it with forest. Uh, and But there was just huge boulders everywhere. Okay. And so it wasn't when I heard what I heard to my left, I thought that can't be a moose or anything because they'll break your legs if they come in here because of the boulder sizes, house mm-hmm. size boulders, car size boulders. Um, and then as I got down to the bottom of the road and came out, uh, there, this is a lot more to the story. Uh, yeah, it came out, it came out and it was looking right at me and I thought it had uh, your dinner plate. Wow. <laughs> and so I had to really emotion again energy emotions are energy and motion and uh, you you discharge a different style of energy out of your body than fear and then you literally feel it hit the animal mm. which will adjust the animal's behavior because the animal is feet is a sensory perceptional creature that lives in the mm. forest that's how they sense things in the forest and you, you got to kind of plug into that sometimes people spiritualize that when it's happening to them in the bush or say uh-huh. you're ghost hunting you go in or i mean just think about it. you're going to go into the into a cemetery in the middle of the night to look for ghosts okay well that's <laughs> as soon as that happens that building block now is primary in your brain so you can be mr macho whatever you want to be but your primal part of your brain's already spooked because you just said, this is what we're doing. <laughs> the rest of your family and your body's going, what the hell are you talking about? I don't want to go out there and do this. What do you, why? You've and already you, set up the scene. You've yeah, set up the yeah, scene. So, you've, you've written the script of what's happening that night. Right. So, I mean, it's kind of, I, I, but I understand that whole thing because I used to help out with um, Satanist investigations in Alberta. Okay. And we used to have to go into areas like that to check it out and stuff. And we okay. did see some of this other stuff that supernaturally i don't like using the word supernaturally but uh, as much as things that we uh, you don't have an answer for it certainly showed up okay. so but. okay are you a private investigator as well then i mean why were you investigating those things uh well because the police were having a problem with satanists in the area uh-huh. and they weren't happy kind of people they were kind of dangerous kind of people okay. and we i uh i used to deprogram people in cults and okay. one of the people i knew was the ex head satanic priest for alberta uh-huh. and we actually became quite good friends and so the police were needing a resource person so i asked them to check out this fellow and so they used him to get kind of inside information about the group that was going on. And it was pretty tough because a uh, pastor and his family, they all had to go under uh, uh, protective custody okay. Okay. and then also uh, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's very interesting. I always said there's a lot more going on in the countryside than the city. <laughs> just, <laughs> I just, it's just boredom. It really boils down to that. <laughs> you ever find somebody that's into really freaky shit, that person's just very bored. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well yeah they got way too much time on their hands too yeah, much time yeah, too especially much time. conspiracy oriented wiring in your don't head move to the country if you want a safe a safe life where nobody's crazy move to some busy busy tower block in the city <laughs> just yeah. kidding just yeah. kidding but you know but there's I lots mean, of stimulus uh, not overload of stimulus but yeah, just the right amount yeah. of stimulus of yes well, on the other hand though for musicians the country is it's a boon it's a it's an amazing development tool the city kills creativity. Yeah. Um, but isolation. Yeah. Anyway, I've gone on a, a tangent. Yeah, you've gone off but track. Yeah, but... yeah go, go, go back to the investigating Satanist bit. The what? I go back, carry on with the, the investigating Satanic cults and the rest of it. So you were out oh. there doing all of that. And the bear. Yeah. yeah. Oh, again, yeah, then the bear thing and that. So, I mean, I've had a very eclectic kind of bizarre life naturally most yeah. people who know me personally would say man well, you just get such a kick out of the style of life you have and stuff <laughs> and I'm not looking for it it just seems to end up in my lap a lot of times yeah. right so uh for me with regards to Sasquatch what's kind of interesting right now is we've had a couple of different sightings uh that are 14 kilometers or 12 or 14 kilometers apart we've been trying to get up there now for uh probably four weeks uh, but the snowpack's a little high, but mm-hmm. we think we can make it up there this weekend and spend the night and grid out that whole area where uh, a hunter has been in there hunting for about 15 years and had an encounter where he bumped into one. 
Wow. And that was that was interesting. And he was definitely, you know, had trauma from it because he was having nightmares, couldn't sleep. Uh, he doesn't want to go back in the area. I mean, he does, but he's afraid to go in by himself. So that was one yeah. reason why. So this is a hunter of bear and and the like and moose and somebody who's not afraid of the woods or what's in them. In yeah, the especially in the area he's been in for 15 years. So he's really familiar with the, the area. So, and when he, when he first had the encounter, he thought it was just another, he, he actually was pissed off because he thought another hunter had found where he hunts. Uh-huh. And then he started walking towards it. And, um, or so he started walking towards who he thought was a hunter and uh, took a peek through his skull and then he realized it wasn't a hunter. And not only mm-hmm. that, it was looking at him before he noticed it. Uh, I asked him specifically that. I said, what, did you bump onto it and then it saw you? Or was it seeing you as you walked yeah. onto it? And he says, no, I seen it as I walked onto to it. And, or it saw me as I walked onto it, I mean. And, uh, and that's a pretty familiar story I've heard. And then it got up, leaned in to take a good look at him first, and then backed up turned around and walked out so the key part for our, our group right now is to get up there with him so he can show uh-huh. us the exact location and then the questions we will get from that is why that way why uh-huh. did it turn that way why didn't it, it could have went that way or this way or that, way? that way why did it choose yeah, exactly. to go that way so what is that way so we grid that whole section of five kilometer section uh, square so we can check for a pathway through there with tracks just to that's, see if there's any that's area. heavy work leon well, that's what you got to do, Andy. I know, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, I could do other things. That's like, pretty that's amazing. I no, this, I think listen, it's a Sasquatch. It, I'm exactly. saying it must be real. It's online. You just heard it. Well, no, I think, that, um, I, I think uh, <laughs> you could, you could uh, easily just yeah, just go with the sighting and go and check out the very area that the sighting took place in. Most people don't go further to grid out a five-kilometer area. That's impressive work. Yeah, <laughs> well, and it the takes a, is, a level of skill I, I definitely don't have. Um, I think it's yeah, fantastic. I don't have it either. That's I'm an old man now, 56 yeah. years old. I've dropped dead five times, so that's oh, why I really wow. appreciate the younger generation in regards to the Sasquatch field. Is they're yes. really questioning a lot of the narrative they're hearing online, and I just I'm really proud that they're doing that, and uh, and it stirs people. things up yeah. for the old school. Yeah, there's yeah. some young people. Um, I, um, two that pop to mind would be people like um, Carrick St. Lauren and uh, Nate Brislin of the Association of Cryptozoological Research and Crash Course Cryptozoology, who are just into the science, not turning anything away, doing sterling work, and not glamorizing or sensationalizing anything that right. they find out. And they're doing great work. So there's all kinds of guys. I'm in the middle ground. I'm 44, so I'm sort of not quite one of the old guys yet, but I'm. what does um, Chris Rock say? You're not really an old guy. It, it's a, it says about this age, being uh, in the club, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you got to yeah, get married, yeah. settle down, because yeah, you can't yeah. go to the club anymore. You're not really an old guy. You're just too old to be in the club. <laughs> that's <laughs> what it is. And I, I think that's where I am, most yeah. significantly. I've been here for quite some time. Yeah, um, yeah it's just one of those weird things. Uh, it's approaching. The middle age is approaching. Oh. Well, I think the other thing is like uh, I, I, I just shake my head a lot of times because I, I, I when you look at coming online uh, before you're researching it, you're just interested in the topic. I mean, mm. I'm sure you've gone through hundreds of videos before you actually got involved with what you're doing right now. I mean, I've uh, twenty eight years almost I think already yeah definitely yeah, and so there's a curiosity part of it and that's a part of the part of the mystery that draws us into you know UFOs yeah. Sasquatch doesn't matter what it is but it's there's it's neat and that's part of your primal primal brain it likes yeah. stuff like that so that feeds that little uh connector synapsis connector <laughs> in your brain uh but then if you start moving into the investigation for whatever topic it is you're mm. looking for I think that's where things start falling apart because it becomes a culture, whether it be yeah. Bigfoot culture or it yeah. becomes um, a UFO culture. And in that, it, it's more about being in the culture than it is about knowing how to do what we're there to do, which is to prove factual evidence that it actually exists. Yeah, because so, there are precepts and paradigms that people have um, based the culture upon and there are famous heroes within the culture that can't be refuted. Right. Yeah. And oh, they've laid yeah. down foundations that... Yeah that have become factual 
you know, so it's pseudo facts that you can no longer dispute. And um, I've been dealing with a lot of that. I've been unfortunately very not vocal, but just honest about what I think about some things. And there's been a slight bit of pushback here and there. Who is this well-spoken English guy telling us? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, Never yeah. mind the fact they ever say this is a, this is an op-ed. It's, not, it's an opinion piece. This yeah. is just what I think. Yeah. That, well, the thing too is I I I I have a problem with so-called critical thinking sites in regards to any of these kind of areas with the UFO and stuff, and they claim to be critical thinking sites. Because critical thinking sites are supposed to be about educating people, how to be critical, how to have the scientific method, which draws us to the other point is, do we want to know what's going on or don't we? Well, if you're in it for the entertainment part of it, no, I don't really want to know what's going on. I just like what I'm hearing and it's neat and well, that's fascinating. But yeah. then it moves from that to curiosity. And then that curiosity moves you into investigating it because it's curious to you. Then you need a standard and we all need a standard. I don't care what perception in regards just to the Bigfoot topic. If you believe that they're interdimensional or that they're from UFOs or whatever like that, we all have to use the same standard to... Um, that information and to me it's the scientific standard scientists yeah. hate it as much as we're going to be frustrated with it because you spend a lot of time finances resources people pouring into a concept and an idea but what i find usually because of how the scientific method works within science they have to bend the knee when new data is presented so they have to stay objective instead of subjective. Subjective truth is when you believe an idea and a concept and you start formulating a hypothesis yeah, and, yeah. You, yeah, and you bring it onto the table. That's biasness. That's what biasness represents. Objectiveness is to look at the data outside of your system because your brain's already, you know, when people are, when you look at something and you, to, you told your brain with intent, I would like to buy a new car, and that's the type of car I would like to buy, whether it be a Honda, whatever it happens to be, or Toyota or Chrysler, then your brain starts looking specifically for that vehicle, and you start noticing you see them all over the place. Now, mm -hmm. you're not choosing to do that. Your brain is doing that because it's a part of what the brain does. So if you pick, or a political side, I pick so-and-so side, I pick so-and-so side. As soon as I consciously choose a side, my brain starts looking for data to verify why I should be on this side. So if I choose, and you've got to stop that whole process, because if you don't, it's going to take you down there. It's called the sunken cost fallacy. Yeah. You can spend a lot of time and energy on there, but you have to vet that information while it's up here so you don't spend three years with a nice formulation. Because on top of that, too, you come online, you start sharing that concept and idea, it gets you cornered into not being able to confess that you're wrong. This was the problem that I've had frequently, not, not, not confessing that I'm wrong. Um, so for a long time, I was uh, very actively researching the British Bigfoot stories and um, getting a lot of flack from the British cryptozoological community for being an advocate for that, but looking into them at least taking the witnesses at their word and investigating, as we all should. Yes. Uh, no reason not to. And then, after much, you know, a lot of deep research into it, I just concluded there wasn't enough independently verified witness reports from multiple sources to justify being an actual thing as far as the information that I had at this time uh, is uh, concerned. It doesn't mean that the witnesses didn't see it. It just means I can't really establish it as a phenomena uh, at this time for me just for me then received even more flack from the other side for coming to the debunking my own theories um and people say well i don't really want to read what you uh, uh, what you've written because you're only going to change your mind about it in six months time <laughs> i have to reread it again but that's what you're supposed to do yes you're supposed yes. to say you know what i could have been wrong about that or well, currently yes. as far as things stand I realize I can't really support that hypothesis any longer. I'm still hopeful that it'll turn out to be true. And there's nothing to do with the witness reports. There's, there's no refutation of them. The eyewitness is always king in my mind. Um, but as to whether you're going to assign him a kingdom, whether you've got to, you know, you could do some research to back it up. Yeah. I think that's, that's the point. We're here looking for something. And, um, or people, are we? Well, that's. I mean, I know you and I are. Yeah, we are, but we're, we're not. So a lot of these these sites and these organizations that sprouted out, I know they had a good intent at the yeah. beginning, 
But the bottom line is you have people who are watching you. You yeah. can't just sit there and make a narration. I always warn on my channel about be cautious of this bloody narration you're yeah. hearing on a screen. You, you, yeah. People watching me right now, you have no idea who I am. You have no idea who I am. So I can sit there and fabricate a nice narrative to make you totally believe what I'm talking about. It's but it doesn't mean if it's factual. It's just your word. And I think that's <laughs> the point. Really, It's right. just the point for all of us. Now, one of the jokes I made with Christopher Turner with the Sticks and Stones documentary, we're out there in Galloway Forest Park in Scotland. Yep. And yep. it was specifically I wanted to go there because I know that the park is full of uh, ticks and midges and it's sodden and there's thick moss and it's wet and uncomfortable. And um, my theory was all of the stick signs primarily were made by people or natural forest for. And if we went to a forest that was very uncomfortable for people, we wouldn't find them. And sure enough, we didn't. Yes. So, and I did the whole That was brilliant. Actually, when I saw that, Andy, I yeah. broke out laughing and I went, oh, did you? brilliant. Oh, you saw it? Brilliant. Absolutely I got brilliant. Right through the calls, right over the calls for, for that one. But oh, I totally. said to Chris a little bit. But we expected it at the beginning. That's exactly what was going on. I said, Chris, I'm just going to give it some really hard in this. And I'm going to say, it's not that what I believe is true. It's just this should be an obvious thing and we should stop embarrassing ourselves you know uh, to to um the non-believers by basically i was starting to call us um there were so many pictures of sticks uh, on people or bigfoot pages i was starting to nickname us the wicker men um we're wicker men we're not bigfoot or sasquatch um uh, uh, uh believers at all we're wicker men we just that's a good way of sticks. saying it yeah. yeah we just collect sticks so um and the other thing what i said the other thing was that we can't see the trees for the woods that's right and that's part of that Parkinson's law of triviality where yeah. I mentioned in one of my videos, I said, uh, if you can hang on to the end, I'm going to throw a grenade into the Bigfoot community. And basically what I was saying, I don't believe 99.9% .9 of all structures we find online are from man. And then I had this death or this skeleton on a, on a, on a cloud going, <laughs> big nuclear explosion, <laughs> another fairy skeleton walking by. Uh, because it, what happens is in any kind of system, the problem is, the origin for why the system first began its purpose changes into mm -hmm. ideologies and then the ideologies become more important than what the topic actually is, exactly. which is the search for Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is, and I got sucked right in online on this whole thing because I trust people. It's yeah. a terrible plague to trust people. And then I'm not saying people are necessarily you have to, to a point. Yeah. To a point yeah. And, to. and yeah. it's not that people are, are, aren't intelligent. People are intelligent, but they're not getting educated so they can make better assessments of situations and if it, all you're getting is narrations but no one's saying why well that's a tree snap. that's from a sasquatch why why is that tree snap from a sasquatch and not from four other things that could possibly be which is weathering snow load insects and disease wind there's so yeah. much wind Oh, I, yeah, we, oh, I mean when i was uh, at loch ness last was with, with the beginning of 2019 uh, investigating a hoaxed photo, it turned out as um, by quite a uh, um, quite a credible source. Actually, he just hoaxed this photo. Uh, well, it appears that he did. I, well, I can't now seeing what the photo was of. It's mm -hmm. hard to imagine that he could have seen it and not realized what it was. But anyway, there you go. I was up there, and there's a, the Great Glen Highway, which goes across, you know, through that great ridge across Scotland. And the part of, in near Fort Augustus, I was in this is big hill, uh, goes up to, we, we, you wouldn't call it a mountain, they call it a mountain, and uh, very heavily forested. And as I went up, it was January, there's nobody about, really steep. I keep finding these trees pushed down across the path all the way. And in the little video clip, I said, I was, I say to myself, but whoever's watching later, if a tree falls in the woods, did Bigfoot push it or did trees just fall in the woods? <laughs> The trees just fall in the woods. Now, I knew it was really windy the day before, but yeah. suddenly coming up there fresh with that in mind, would look and say, oh, look at this. It's like it's blocking the path. We're not supposed to go any further. Well, you yes, there could be more falling trees to come down, so maybe you shouldn't go further. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, if yeah. they're falling because they're just in the woods. I, look, I think it's, um, it's a wonderful genre. It's amazing. It's endlessly fascinating. Not just Bigfoot, but the whole scale and there's somebody i'm uh, uh, a colleague i'd call him but it, 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 friends with uh, dr carl shuka the the writer cryptozoologist and zoologist 
he's got so many blogs and books about regular types of animals that are unknown a new type of lizard uh you know a strange kind of vole or an odd rat that's only been sighted three times that's cryptozoology so is bigfoot so is nessie and the rest of this stuff but those types of animals they're the no, mothman they're, they're the rock stars of cryptozoology they're the ones that everybody is interested in not many people are, um, are interested in the, the, the three banded skink oh, yeah. Guantanamo Bay or it, that just yeah, means yeah. that you know something like that they're not out there searching for the three banded skink now when it comes to the paranormal side of things or the woo side as people call it I often wonder with other animals that we've discovered like the okapi discovered in the 90s or the giant squid that would have most likely been the kraken in former times before we, we found that imagine that somebody was investigating that and said you know um maybe the natives around the congo there saw the okapi on occasion and coincidentally uh somebody in their tribe died right afterwards yep and then this legend builds up doesn't it that uh, if you see the okapi that you'll die <coughs> or it has mystical powers and the man was cursed or affected and the rest of it. I felt like it was speaking to me. It got inside my mind, man. Um, you know, you would think that was ridiculous because we know the Okapi is uh, just a regular animal. But if it was still out there undiscovered, well, what's it like? It's like a horse with the head of a giraffe and the, the legs of a zebra. You'd be like, what? That's crazy. That's a that's a totally made-up animal. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the similar thing with a giant squid. It, every time it disappeared, we couldn't find it after a sighting. If somebody said it jumped into a portal, it'd be like, oh, come on. And that's why I think it's sometimes it's too much of a stretch when we do that. I'm, I'm a Christian married to a Jew. We both believe in God, but we have different concepts of that. That one tr person that we believe in may be real, but our concept of what he is or what it is is very different to one another. Um, right. maybe not well, I mean, you're going to have a bit of a process on that whole thing because there's two ways of knowing truth, analytically and intuitively. Mm -hmm. and we call it a schism between the heart and the head. Uh -huh. In other words, you can't intu in, you can't convince anybody by data that you ask, actually love your wife to death. Yeah, uh -huh. you could maybe see you do acts of it, but it doesn't mean yeah. that that can prove it. So there's always been a, a and that's part of the spiritualization of the brain, which is not your chakra, as I mentioned that before. There's actual housing part of your brain. It's right here. or uh, So, yeah, it's, it's on the right here on this side. Uh, that houses the spiritualization because it's a, a way your brain tries to cope with not having data or information of knowing what you're experiencing or looking at. I was talking to somebody today about the thing about uh, spiritual things is, especially when it comes to Christian things, is uh, we have a terrible tendency of spiritualizing things in regards to the theology we listen to. But when it becomes reality, the incident that has been spiritualized becomes reality. It makes contextual sense in the real world. Okay. So a good example of that is the Jews. Uh, they were expecting this return of the Jesus, who's the big emperor, king, soldier coming back to save them. Oh, yeah. and Right. Yeah, yeah. And does he show up as a big king on a nice horse with a lance and all that? No, he shows up with a donkey <laughs> and he rides a donkey <laughs> into town. Uh, that makes contextual sense, according to the scriptures, didn't to the Jewish people who projected onto the scriptures what they were hoping th that uh -huh. meant. And that's the same thing when you're looking at projections and stuff in regards to any type of data collecting is you there's a parts of your brain that you have to be aware that like right now i'm looking at you on a screen or people are looking at me on the screen and all you are actually seeing at home right now is that right there that's 2020 vision so the mm -hmm. width of your nose the width of my nose everything else that you're seeing around me here your brain is actually reproducing it uh -huh. until you look with intent to that specific you spot filling in the blanks and it's happening. And so that's why as soon as you're out in this area here in your visuals, uh, you've got to watch out that your brain doesn't play some tricks with you. Because like, for instance, that one where you went and found out that, well, it can't be necessarily, a, uh, it's got to be kind of a fake picture because he would have known that what he yeah. was looking at was oh, right. Yeah. There but was not no room for him to Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, let's go down. Let's be a little fair here. If you've told your system with your database that uh -huh. you're looking for a, <laughs> a monster that's like Loch Ness or the Ogopogo. Uh -huh. uh, that image 
is now projected onto something that other people that might have seen, but your blinders and projection parts of your brain are already bought into that's what it is. So that's why you're actually seeing what you're actually seeing. And th that's a weird thing. Illusionists use it all the time on people to trick people's brains. Uh -huh. huh? When I teach courses and want to get, uh, uh, especially on courses on perception, I want to get people's attention. What I do is I, I'll point at to the back of the class and say, I want you guys to take a look at that because I know the brain likes pattern and mm -hmm. it'll go from point A to point B and it will fill in the visuals as their eyes move towards that. And that's exactly when I'm going to put something in set uh, as far as do a setup. I'm going to put a setup in that part okay. where your brain's carrying the visual data it's taken to fill in that blank to go over to there. So uh -huh. it's pretty crazy stuff. And you have to know this stuff. I mean, I, I mean I'm a scientific kind of guy um, as far as critical thinking, systematic thinking, uh, objective thinking, and I'm looking for factual stuff to help. I don't understand why this is so complicatedly frustrating yeah. for people in regards to <laughs> wanting to know the truth. Why do because we react believe, to trying to when you find- When you somebody's belief with the truth, Oh, or at least the, 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 the truth as far as data is concerned, the, right. the truth as it stands, um, that, that, that there's no logic to the, to the response. And I know this as a religious there person. Isn't. I know this as spending a lot of time in a part of the world that has lots of religious tensions. I go to Israel quite a lot. And um, one of my funny experiences I had in Jerusalem, actually, was that when I went to the old city, we went to the Muslim quarter and the Jewish quarter and the Christian quarters as to the Armenian and the, the Christian quarter. Um, my wife's brother at the time, she, he asked me what I thought about it. Would I like to go another time? And I said, no, I have been back since. But I said, no, I, I didn't enjoy it. And um, he said, why not? I said, Jerusalem, the old Jerusalem city anyway, it's like um, inviting three friends to a party that hate each other. But they all really like you, and none of them will leave because they're your friend. Mm. They're the friend. That's important. And mm. you know, there's a religious perception that they're all there for the same reason, essentially, you know, ideologically speaking. And yet, there is no um, there's no symmetry in acceptance or communication between them. Although the reason is essentially the same. Right. I know the details are different, and you know that seems to extend out in the bigger community as well. So. They're all in people are everybody is interested in it for the same reason, but the ideology, the details of that reason are different per person. And when you insult that, and you I find that on so many Bigfoot pages that I formerly respected, and now people are putting all of these blurry blob squishes of all the classic blurred <laughs> bushes with red circles, and you know, and I think yeah. um it it's odd. But what the oddest thing about it, it's not that somebody's posted it, is the amount of comments the highest level of interaction comments and likes and you know criticisms and fights as well you will get on any page bigfoot page is that kind of picture oh it's okay. not something that looks like that are you, are you there? yeah i'm here did i freeze yeah you're good now oh i'm sorry no I'm no sorry. it's okay it's um, okay it was just a few seconds there okay so what i'm saying is uh, what's odd about these Bigfoot pages is the blob squash or essentially, especially the bushes with red circles around with the description of two dog men, one Bigfoot and the juvenile holding a spear. And you obviously you can't playing see cards. Don't and playing cards part. and just one making an omelet in the back. And um, people will defend that to the hilt and say, you know, people will criticize and support the person and say, you know, there's too many non-believers on here. And uh, if you don't believe in this, I was there. So I know what I saw. Well, um, somebody sent me a picture once just to, just to prove this. And, um, I, I think my answer seemed to explain it to me anyway, explain what the problem was. They sent me a picture like this. It was, uh, uh, three dog men in the picture and it was just circles or traces around them. They're just bushes. And, um, I said, uh, oh, thank you for the picture. I'm really sorry, but I, I, I can't really see what you photographed. I can't see these dog men you're talking about. And I was like, yeah, duh. I mean, they're cloaking. They're invisible. And I said, I said, I said, I replied, well, if they're invisible, why did you take a picture? <laughs> and his response, 
Yeah, what's his response back to that one? He didn't answer. Respond at all. <laughs> yeah, I blocked. I think I was blocked. Off to it. That, makes, that makes kind of sense now that you say it the way you yeah. said it to uh, me. <laughs> if they're invisible, why did I take a picture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty nutty for sure. This is where we are. Yeah, this is where we are. Well, I think that, you know, I, I would back up a little bit too is, you know, re low resolutional style of capacity of thinking on, in Western culture has really gotten lifted compared to the capacity of having high resolutional uh, ways of thinking. And that's about having capacity to really look at things at a deeper level. And uh, part of it is, well, depending on what country you're from, it's kind of funny about... Uh, the Brits, the Aussies, and the Canadians, because we all have history together, mm -hmm. we also carry a kind of an imprint in us because of that history. Uh, and the Americans, and no offense to my American friends, by the way, what I'm saying is, uh, we don't see it the same way they see it. And um, there's a bit of overlap in certain ideas and certain things and certain concepts, but our culture is a little different. Uh, you know, Brits can smile at us and speak with their accent, and you'd be slapping us with an insult, and we'd say... <laughs> oh yeah, uh, that, that happens well, just a lot. In your British accent, okay, yeah. that must be right, you know. <laughs> or, uh, the, but you have a way of trying, to, almost kind of helping the rest of the planet uh, see things with a bit of uh, certainty, even though you're spanking us at the same time as saying it. I, do, I no, I don't like the way that uh, that um, English people do that sometimes, or British people do that, and I've often wondered, am I? doing it when I'm talking to people face to face. I hope not. But I think there's something about the accent. I've perceived this uh, from the North American side. Let's just say North America in, in general. Sure. Um, Americans especially. Canadians a little less because they're more used to the accent. Um, but it, there's still some of that. And I often wondered um, how often are they just listening to me speak instead of listening to what I'm saying. And I'm thinking it's like 70 30 <laughs> 70 30 and thinking that i know what i'm talking about because of this um uh, assumed um iq that seems to come along with it now if you live here in the uk you know that's far from true very far from true <laughs> yeah totally and um, totally. i mean we're, we're not uh, overall countrywide one yeah. we don't sound like me for the most part and two we're not that bright um, <laughs> And the one thing I do like about Americans, especially, and Canadians too, is that when they choose to do something, they choose to become expert at it. They find out every single thing about every single facet and aspect of that thing. They nail their colors to the mask and say, this is what I'm doing, by the way, everybody. British people don't do that. They just kind of hide it. Then they say, well, yeah, I speak a bit of French, which means they can order a beer and go to the shops. When somebody, like when a French person says they speak some Italian, they mean they can like have a conversation. They could live there in a basic sort of fashion, being yes. polite to people, but they couldn't do calculus or, or okay. philosophy. Yes, yes, yes. You know, yes. and that's the difference. I think we're an awfully unprepared people. As far as expertise is involved, we've got a great intelligentsia and very smart people. We're very good at getting experts to do things. But I think as a general population, we don't really have that that fire that the Americans have, especially. And I'd say this, and I think the difference, the thing the Australians, uh, New Zealanders, British and Canadians have in common, and what makes us different to the Americans, is that we are all subjects. We have a queen. They are citizens. And that's the difference. They've got that citizen mindset. You can be anything you want to be. Right. Whereas we have this kind of, well, especially in Britain, this history of, I implicitly know what class somebody is just by talking to them. Um, and if there's is above mine, you know, subconsciously, and they feel it too, I can feel it when we speak. And yet, to a complete stranger to the culture like my wife, she gets a foreign exemption. She just gets to ride the wave, and she doesn't know what anybody calls it. We just all sound the same. <laughs> <coughs> well, I think the difference too is that we are still uh, countries that have our tribes intact. Uh, when you look at the American system, political system right now, it's really turned into troopism, which is not a good position for any country to be in uh, because no one can hear anybody because they're too emotionally caught on to yeah. the, I don't know if that some of that is part of some of the symptoms that I see online 
uh, on uh, Bigfoot channels of reactionary stuff because it's almost a very similar scent to the, the when uh, tribes turn into troopism and tribe tribalism is we might be different culturally have different perspectives in that but we still have a civility and respect towards each other mm. but once we turn to troopism is you i notice you're not one of our believers okay. and then we have to do some i either have to convert you over it's kind of like when i deal with christians as well i have a pastoral degree by the way convert or uh, kill. what's that uh, troopism convert or kill <laughs> yeah yeah. yeah, you know, and uh, or, uh, you know, people say, well, I just read the scripture. It's easy to understand. Well, we wouldn't have 30,000 different tribes of de denominations for just the Christian community if it was that bloody easy to understand, you know. Yeah. And, and then you add into the, the mix of I have an opinion, uh, no matter what topic it is, as soon as I have an opinion and I should have the freedom to have my belief about my opinion. Well, you can have any belief you want about your opinion, but it doesn't mean it's going to be factually true. I have lots of beliefs about opinions about things that I was totally wrong, but I sincerely thought I was totally 100% factual on. I was wrong. I wasn't. I didn't know at the time, and nor did I care whether I was wrong. I didn't want to be wrong, so I'm not going to be. Uh, uh, uh. You know, my data collecting is going to go through that filter. Um, and so, I mean, I, as somebody who I like the unknown stuff. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day about, well, a couple of times people have asked me about, have you heard about those UFOs that the U.S. government has now revealed, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And I thought, yes, yes, I have. Have you heard of the uh, patent that went into the U.S. patent agency from the United States Marine or United States Navy regarding pa a patent for a tic-tac uh, hypersonic drone? No, I haven't heard about that. <laughs> okay. And, and then do you also aware that the patent office refused it because they didn't believe it was actually able to pull it off where the U.S. government had to come back to uh, say, no, we actually have this right now. If you guys want to validate this, I would suggest that you take a look at uh, Simon Holland, Professor Simon Holland. Are you familiar with him? No. Well, Online. I don't follow ufology anyway. Yeah. So I, well, I well, the thing is, is, you'll probably really enjoy his systematic scientific method. He's uh -huh. he's done movies from Star Wars to all this kind okay. of stuff. He's yeah. a film expert. Okay. And uh, he talks about all this kind of stuff on his channel and stuff. But he gets uh, documentation, and you can check out the documentation. And it's a rep he's trustworthy source. I know that's hard to believe in the news mm -hmm. world today because everyone says they're the trustworthy source. But there's a few. There's a few kicking around. Well, yeah, and you got to find yeah. them, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, so you know, and that's kind of the way I'm bent and wired when it comes to any of this kind of stuff. Um, I remember somebody once was. Oh, I can't remember exactly what the incident was, but they were projecting onto something of being uh, Satanist or Satanic or the devil was doing it because they were going uh -huh. into fight or freeze. And I looked at them and I said, that's not what's going on. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with the devil. <laughs> well, what are you sure? And I said, you're scared. <laughs> I'm standing right next to you. I don't feel scared and fear in my body. You're mm -hmm. scared. So your brain needs something to, so, and he was a Christian, so he projected on it. It was a gift of discernment he was getting from God, and that there's something evil happening on the other uh -huh. side. Totally miss it. And again, this is this, when, when we spiritualize things, we can't see the actual evidence of what's going on. Yeah, there's a guy on the other side of the room, and he's throwing shit all over the room and destroying the room. He went to, he's demon-possessed. Yeah. I went to, holy smokes, I bet you this guy's got a pretty bad, pretty bad serious wound in his soul. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I think I've encountered that a lot during my um, religious life, and there's something I like to refer to as the jukebox Jesus. Yes. You know, play the tune I want you to play. God, yeah. um, one of the best things religiously that ever happened to me is when I realized that just because I believed in God in a certain way that I believed was right, the right way, didn't exempt me from the normal conditions of mortality. It didn't exempt me uh, from suffering. It didn't exempt me from doing well or anything like that or trying. It just meant that I had a belief in an afterlife and God in a way that I thought was correctly assessed and um, and followed. And yet, we often say, wow, you know, and Christians, people of all religious bents have crisis of conscience like this uh, throughout their lives something bad happens you know somebody close dies or is hurt or 
a big loss takes place. And suddenly, like, God, how could you let this happen to me? I believed in you. I followed you all, <clears throat> all of my life. I've been a good Christian or, or Jew or whatever. And what they don't think about when they say that is, well, how could you have let it happen to everybody else who doesn't believe anything or doesn't believe what you believe this whole time? You were cool with that. <laughs> but yeah. you're not okay when yeah. you get it in return. Surely yeah. we're just, you know, you're part of this is life and everything that can happen in life can happen to you regardless of of what you've signed up to and uh there you go that's and that's the same with everything uh, we should probably um wind it down but just in uh, in regards to your research in regards to what you're doing at the moment you said you've got a few projects on a few teams that you're trying to get out into the wilderness oh, what's next what's next on the agenda for you well there's two different things the first thing is just getting access to what we need to get access into mm -hmm. for the research areas that we do and then gridding that out. And uh, right now in the springtime is where we start getting a lot of reports that are coming in. So one of the local uh, news places here uh, asked if I send them some material about what's going on in regards to Sasquatch and Bigfoot in the area. They'll probably use it when there's nothing else in the news to talk uh -huh. about. I don't know if that'll ever happen. Uh, but it, that, that's kind of the important part is you got to get your name out there regards to this mm. kind of stuff so that it's pretty embarrassing for people who have experiences because, again, they don't know who to talk to. Mm. And, uh, and it's kind of concerning for me that people who have had experiences that they connect up with a fairly balanced, solid uh, organization so they don't get kind of caught into some of these ide ideologies that are out there. Um, that I don't personally invest in myself, uh, believing in. Um, so there's that side of it. The other side of it is to, I, you know, I like science and I like to find out whether things are factual. And I want to know if I'm, I know what I'm talking about mm -hmm. in regards to, I don't have a problem admitting if I'm, I'm wrong. I don't know if anyone else has that problem. <laughs> My suspicion yeah. is I don't know if the liberty is available for other people to say, I, I was totally wrong on that. Oh, you know, okay. it's, it's very liberating, actually. To, totally. To you don't say have to that hide. you're wrong. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> some people, uh, yeah. they make a, uh, a career out of it, but that's not, not my intention. But yeah, it's very yeah. liberating to say, I think I might have been wrong about that. Yeah. It actually gives a person a little more credibility. You can use it as a technique if you're that way inclined. Um, yeah. And again, on my channel, I'm not looking for, you know, I didn't come online because... I had nothing better to do and I'm going to do a Bigfoot channel so I get 70,000 yeah. to 50,000 subscribers. I don't want 50 or 70,000 subscribers, man. If I taught a class and a class was 600 people, that's a great size class oh, to good. teach good quality good. stuff or even 250 people. I don't need 100,000 people. I need the right people. And if that's 10 right people across North America, that's what I need to find a Sasquatch with. And uh, I'm not here to be... Uh, I'm. I'm pretty solid in who I am as a person. I, I don't, I'm not here to, oh, I got to go online. I got so much going on already in regards to what I do professionally online and on this kind of stuff. It's pretty hard to have any time to do what I'd like to do. If I was doing it full time, I would break it down every Oh, yeah. Time. So, I mean, so. There's, um, there's just so much to get done and so little time to do it in. However, uh, assuming now that you've you've peaked, you've had your number of near death experiences, you got them out of the way. You can be with us for a while. I do hope that um, you will be, you know, out there in the field. Line. I'm excited about what you're doing. To be honest with you, I think it. Um, if I ever get over to that side of the country, and I I should be in the U.S. later in the year if everything goes to plan. So maybe if there's um, if I've got my contact tracing app for coronavirus on, and I've got my valid travel pass and test and I've had all the vaccines and swabs and humiliating procedures in the airport <laughs> it might pop by yeah um, no, that'd be awesome yeah that'd be fantastic listen I'll take a bite here but um I really appreciate it being fascinating chat and let's, let's stay in touch I'd love to know what's going on over there and if you ever get down to Lake Okanagan please send me a photo I'd, I'd love to see down that. To, well I could just take my laptop and show you it's right here oh really <laughs> Yeah, at the window. I got like tons of lakes, like everywhere. O Okanagan Lake is right behind my place, all the way down. Why are you not? Why are we not doing this interview on the water? <laughs> well, I'm doing it outside, but it's raining today. I would have to okay. actually filmed this outside. With okay, you. well then there's no excuse. I, I would really 
uh, genuinely appreciate a photo of that lake and oh, especially one with a monster in it, if at all possible. I'm sure I can get uh, some styrofoam and paint it black. And I, I used to, I'm pretty yeah. good at backdrops for uh, acting and stuff. So I'm pretty sure I can come up with something Just for you. Wait for a bow wave to pass yeah. by and, and take a photo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Listen, Leon, thank you so much. Um, have a great weekend. Thanks, man. And, uh, yeah, stay safe. Bye-bye. Okay. okay. <laughs>